signed a quarterback without anyone knowing who he is. We're unraveling the mystery behind Zach Ludwig's commitment. And the only uncommitted five-star in this cycle tells us a firm date of when he'll make his decision. Deuce Robinson joins the show. Plus, how Nicholas Harbor can serve as a South Carolina recruiting springboard. All that and more as the College Football Recruiting Show starts right now. Alongside our director of scouting, Andrew Ivins, I'm Emily Proud. Submit your questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end of the show. The only way you can do that, though, is if you are subscribing to the 24-7 Sports YouTube page. Also, please like this video. It helps spread the word and grow the show. So hit that like button and we will hit some headlines. Hey, Charles Kelly is our 24-7 Sports National Recruiter of the Year. The former Tide assistant helped Alabama build one of the top classes of all time this past cycle. Andrew, now he's in Boulder, serving as the Buffs DC and helped land five-star Cormani McLean. What makes him such a strong recruiter? He's down to earth. This is a guy that has worked not only at the high school level, but all different levels of college football. He's bounced around, won a national title at Florida State. I think he just does an excellent job of recruit or relating with recruits. He understands that recruiting is all about relationships uh, and he wins those kids over, whether it's chalk talk, whether it's selling a vision, letting a recruit drive his pickup truck on an official visit. Charles Kelly knows how to push all the right buttons. Well, speaking of Colorado, Coach Prime collecting two commitments over the weekend. You got three-star offensive lineman Taylor Chandler and four-star athlete Juwan Johnson. The Buffs currently Sitting at 12th in the 2024 rankings, what they just add, Andrew? Well, Taylor Chandler is a kid we saw a couple of years ago at the FBU Freshman All-American Bowl. He might not be the tallest offensive lineman, but he's long. And as you see on tape, he's a mauler. You need that to win in the Pac-12, some beef up front. Johnson, you put on the, his highlight tape, and you're going to see a guy that's running around playing some quarterback. Sounds like Coach Prime wants to use him maybe on defense, play a little bit of offense. If anyone's going to let him go both ways or knows how to do it, on both sides of the ball. It's Coach Prime. He was one of the best to ever do it in his time. All right, more commitment talk with Steve Wilfong in just a bit. Meanwhile, a flip alert for 2023 four-star defensive back Warren Roberson. He announced his flip from TCU to Texas. But get this, he actually signed his LOI with the Longhorns last week. So, Andrew, outside of being real sneaky, what else stands out to you about this player? Warren made plays in all three phases of the game as a senior. Sounds like Texas wants to use him at safety. I think that makes a ton of sense. He's twitched up. He likes to hit. And for all we talk about Arch Manning, Cedric Baxter, and what the Longhorns did on offense, I really like this defensive group. 11 composite four-star or five-star prospects on that side of the ball. I think they're going to turn around that defense, which is needed as they prepare to head to the SEC. All right, a four-star safety asking for a release from his letter of intent with Miami. Antoine Jackson signed with the Hurricanes during the early signing period back in December. So, Andrew, how big a blow is this to Mario Cristobal's class? I don't think it's much of a loss at all. Antoine Jackson, he's got some tools, he's got some traits, but he's actually a kid that's super young. He reclassified from the class of 2024 to 2023. We were all kind of scratching our heads. Interesting that he wants out, but I don't think Miami, this is a blow in any way. Uh, he wasn't expected to be part of the equation anytime soon for the Hurricanes, and they really like what they did uh, in the defensive backfield without Jackson. Okay, get this. Michigan commit Zach Ludwig posted his decision on Instagram back in November, but because in his words, quote, my Insta is not that big, a lot of people missed it, including us. Our director of recruiting, Steve Wiltfong, got to the bottom of it, and we have since added a profile for the young man. Steve, joining the show now, you actually chatted with Zach. I mean, just what in the world happened here? Well, he visited in November. Coach Jim Harbaugh offered him a scholarship. He jumped on it, and he's in the fold for the Wolverines. Called it the ultimate environment uh, that all the coaches and players make when you're up there, and then said that the players made him feel included in everything you do. It's like a big family up there, and he's part of a class that ranks seven early in the cycle. All right. 
We'll see what he does at the next level. Uh, looking ahead to some of the top available prospects in the 2024 class, Williams and Winery, he's the top D lineman in the country. What's ahead as his recruitment ramps up? Yeah, so he's got a couple visits locked in. He's going to visit uh, Oklahoma the first weekend of March. That's going to be a big recruiting weekend for the Sooners. I know some other programs are really lining up that weekend to be a big one as well. So Oklahoma going to get the number one defensive lineman in the country on campus for that weekend. It's the first weekend coming out of the dead period as no college visits are being taken this month. And he's also got Colorado locked in for the spring game. He just recently announced his offer from Colorado, but he's been building a relationship with defensive ends coach Nick Williams for a while behind the scenes, and he's going to go visit Colorado for the spring game. And as we can see by the recent junior day that Colorado just had, and with Williams now and Airy coming in for the spring game, we know what kind of uh, blue chip, or we know that Colorado's big game hunting on the recruiting trail, and Williams now and Airy is one of several uh, elite prospects that I think will be at their spring game. Steve, Ryan Wingo, that's a prospect that we've talked about at length on this show. Number four ranked wide receiver, someone uh, that continues to add offers. What's the latest with his recruitments and what is he going to do once the dead period is over and he can get back out on the road? Yeah, so he's got one visit locked in Alabama the first weekend of March. Hank South at Bama Online tells me that's going to be a big recruiting weekend for Alabama that weekend of March 4th. And his dad tells me that they're going to be in Tuscaloosa. Now, Alabama just offered this week, but similar to Williams Nowanary in Colorado, Alabama has been talking to Ryan Wingo and his family for a while behind the scenes. And uh, he's got a longstanding relationship with new offensive coordinator Tommy Reese, who offered him when he was a freshman at Notre Dame. And, and Coach Roach has made an impression uh, at Alabama, the area recruiter. So he's going to go check it out. I think Tennessee is in a really good spot for him. He just had a great visit to Colorado at the end of last month. Penn State's impressed him. Clemson is impressed. He's been to Missouri. Uh, um, so he's been making the rounds. Texas A&M, Oregon, a couple others in the mix for Ryan Wingo. Alabama's going to get a chance to make a move first weekend of March. All right, let's talk some quarterbacks. Georgia already landing four-star quarterback Ryan Puglisi, but that did not stop them from also offering four-star quarterback Jake Merklinger. So what did he have to say about that dog's offer, Steve? Well, he's pretty excited about getting an offer from the in-state power, and he says he's looking to line up a visit with Georgia this spring. Talking to Dogs 247 Insider Rusty Manzo today, as we know, Georgia did not sign a quarterback in the 2023 cycle, so they're in the market for potentially two here in 2024. Love their position with Dylan Rayola, the number one ranked quarterback in the country in the 2024 cycle, but Jake Merklinger is a guy that if you don't get into those sweepstakes, you may not ever have a chance to land him. Tennessee's done a good job in this recruitment. He was at North Carolina in January. He's going to go back the first weekend of March to watch the Tar Heels take on Duke in that basketball rivalry where he'll get around the coaching staff again. He said he really enjoyed hanging out at Mac Brown's house uh, last month. He's starting to build a relationship with Chip Lindsey over there. And certainly what North Carolina can point to any quarterback right now with Drake May coming back. The Tar Heels are strongly in the mix. Uh, Michigan State and Tennessee are other places that Merklingler says he's looking to set up visits with here in the spring as well. But Georgia, they need to hit big at quarterback. Well, to say that the two-time defending national champs <laughs> need to do anything on the trail is a <laughs> little bit fine. over the top. But they could use a, a talented quarterback this mm -hmm. cycle, and they're in great position for Dylan Rayola, and, and they like Merklinger. Can't count out Mac Brown. He's got that swim, the swing uh, simulator in the house, the golf simulator. Steve, two recent crystal ball picks for you in favor of South Carolina, a pair of offensive linemen. Uh, what do we need to know there? Well, South Carolina, they recruited a terrific offensive line class in 2023, Drew, as you know, and they're trying to follow it up with maybe one of the best in the 2024 cycle. They have Cam Pringle already in the fold. Blake Franks is an offensive lineman from Greenville, South Carolina. The Gamecocks recently went there and landed top 247 receiver Mazio Bennett out of their uh, uh, former Tennessee commit. Now they're trying to beat Clemson for Blake Franks. This has been a back and forth recruitment, but I really like where the Gamecocks stand with him. And then you have Josiah Thompson, who's our number two ranked offensive tackle in the country. He's the number one player in the state from Dillon Dillon High School there in Alabama, Clemson, Georgia. All those programs are strongly in the mix for him. But I think South Carolina is in really good position for him as well. And if they can add Franks and Thompson to Pringle, that would be 
uh, massive additions. And if you go to those young men's social media after Pringle committed, both of them uh, tweeted photos of them with Pringle saying, congrats, all decked out in South Carolina gear. Maybe they'll be wearing it together for years to come. All right, we'll see. We have some more Gamecock talk later in the show. For now, though, a few more quarterbacks coming off the board over the last few days. The latest was Anthony Maddox. He committed to Texas A&M right here on the 24-7 Sports YouTube page last night. So, Steve, what can the Aggies look forward to with him? Well, I like this pickup for for Texas A&M to go into the state of Mississippi and land a guy that threw for over 2,000 yards and 20 touchdowns, added close to 400 more rushing yards. And when you turn on his film, I think you see a guy that's a fluid, athletic, twitchy quarterback with a live arm, quick release. There's some throws on there that really pop. You know, he puts the ball downfield with zip. You see some really nice touch throws, some really high level plays on, on his tape. And and Texas A&M, you know, this is a guy that Bobby Petrino and Jimbo Fisher keyed in on. Uh, got him. To, he, he visited Texas A&M during the season. They got him back in January, and now he's in the fold and ready to help the Aggies build on their class. You mentioned Bobby Petrino. He compared the kid to Lamar Jackson. I think you see a little bit uh, of that in the tape. <laughs> Uh, another quarterback that came off the board over the weekend, Walker White on Friday. He commits to Auburn, number eight ranked quarterback. This is a guy that can run the RPOs. He's big, he's physical. Steve, uh, do you think this could be a possible bell cow for Hugh Freeze and the Tigers? Well, Andrew, you and I met him for the first time together at the all America Bowl National Combine two years ago. Not this past year, but a G- two Januaries ago, and he looked like he went to Auburn right then and there, didn't he? I mean, he is as physically ready uh, or as physically imposing a quarterback as I've seen in doing this job. But he's six foot four, 218 pounds, and as you said, can run that RPO offense, has a really strong arm. Auburn beating Clemson uh, and Baylor here at the end, but also had offers from Alabama, Oklahoma, among others. And, and, and when you look at Auburn, they had their best recruiting class since 2018 this cycle on really short notice uh, for this 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 staff led by Hugh Freeze to now get a full cycle to win a recruiting battle like they just did for Walker White over Clemson I think it shows the kind of potential recruiting chops that we can uh, uh, picture for Auburn we've seen Auburn as high as number 12 in the standings over the last five to seven cycles and I think now that's their potential moving forward Auburn goes from being a uh, uh, an overlooked hat on the table to a realistic uh, uh, player when blue chippers list them moving forward with them beating Clemson for Walker White. Andrew, what would you think of Walker White? Oh, he's a big guy. I mean, if you're looking for a Tim Tebow in this class, I know I just said Lamar Jackson, all these goodness. crazy Tim comps, Tebow. but I just watched one of his games uh, right before he came on the show and he, he improvises. He loves to lower his shoulder and, he can make some impressive throws. So I think it fits exactly what Hugh Freeze wanted to do. I mean, remember he had Malik Willis when he was at Liberty, a guy that also ran for over a thousand yards. I think this is a perfect fit. And when he committed on Friday, I mean, I was off. I thought the kid was possibly headed to Clemson. I said, hey, this is the perfect Auburn type of quarterback. And I think he's a guy that uh, will be able to re- recruit some of his peers. So nice pickup for the Tigers as they look to kind of figure things out under center long term. Tim it. Tebow had those elite leadership qualities. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, to say that someone's that kind of leader is tough to put on someone this early. But Walker White, when he committed, he named like 20 players. He was committing to Auburn. His high school coach talked about the kind of leader he is for them. And he certainly has all those intangibles coveted at the position. Yep, intangibles is the word, especially when it comes to quarterback. Steve, thank you so much for joining us here. Hey, check out new episodes of the Wilt Fong Whip Around every Monday and Friday on the 24-7 Sports YouTube page. And if you like Steve Wilt Fong and all his great analysis, please like this video. I know that it will make him very happy. He will smile, maybe. We get some more likes. You smile. Two thumb- He's giving me two thumbs up here. I love it. Like. I love it. Yeah, like the video. Hit that like button. We'd love to hear from you. All right, there is one last question mark, major question mark in the 2023 class. The only unsigned five-star, the top tight end, Deuce Robinson, will make his decision here soon. Larry Angulo caught up with the dual sport athlete to find out when and what's coming. With the word Dodgers embroidered across his chest and the number 40 on his back, 
Deuce Robinson put on his cap and returned to the baseball field this past weekend. As college football coaches await the final decision of the nation's number one rated tight end in the 2023 class, the multi-sport aspirations that have driven this entire process carry on. The traditional signing day is in the rearview mirror, so this high-profile recruitment has gone into overtime, or maybe it's extra innings, depending on which equipment bag Robinson has thrown over his shoulder on a given day. The five-star prospect was in the City of Angels to compete at the area code Select West, a multi-day showcase event where some of the region's best baseball players had an opportunity to flash their skills in front of scouts and evaluators. For a player that has the goal of hearing his name called early in the MLB draft this summer, it served as another stage to make an impression. And although he wasn't ready to come off the board on February 1st when the signing period opened up, Robinson told 24-7 Sports he does have a general roadmap towards that football decision. April 1st is the cutoff date, um, so I'll have a decision by then. Um, as, as far as when that date may be, I couldn't really tell you, um, but, but I 100% plan on uh, you know, committing, signing to a school, and, and being there um, whenever move-in day is. That football commitment could be this month, or it could be sometime in March. Georgia and USC have been considered the top contenders for the five-star with the likes of Alabama, Oregon, and Texas also remaining in the mix down the stretch. Robinson met in home with both USC coach Lincoln Riley and Georgia coach Kirby Smart, among others, back-to-back on the final week before the start of the current dead period. The two-time defending national champion Bulldogs and the nearby Trojans have continued to make their pitches. They were gracious about it. Uh, I, I definitely probably haven't made their lives easy. Um, just, just with everything that's been going in on the, uh, into this decision, uh, you know, my recruitment hasn't been a normal recruitment. Um, but, but I mean, I think at least I hope they understand that. Um, and I think, I think the schools we've narrowed it down to really do. Um, they're really pushing, fighting for me. Um, and so, you know, it means a lot that they're that they're still sticking through with me through this. Robinson has also been playing basketball for Pinnacle this winter while mixing in week-long football events like the Under Armour All-America game in Orlando, Florida, and the Polynesian Bowl All-Star game in Hawaii. In the batter's box, the 6'6", six 225-pound six, outfielder has drawn comparisons to Aaron Judge for his physical build and raw power. And as high as his ceiling is in football, baseball is also a very realistic career path. His father, Dominique, played receiver at Florida State in the early 2000s and was also drafted in baseball. No matter where Deuce Robinson ends up playing his college football, the goal remains clear. Get drafted in both sports. From what we've heard, I think I think I have the potential to, to go pretty high, but um, but no one really knows until until uh, later throughout the spring and, and into the summer. It's definitely it's definitely pretty difficult, um, especially because you know the guys here are some of the best in the nation. Um, but but it's honestly fun. Uh, it's a challenge that that uh that we've been we've been working with my whole life. So. Um, so, I mean, trying to face that challenge, trying to get through that challenge and succeed, uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay, Andrew, I have a question about Deuce Robinson. But first, if you think hitting the like, bu- like button does not make a difference, it made our friend Steve Wolfong so happy that he's actually in the chat right now. So if you want to hear from Steve, you have any questions for him, again, you have to subscribe to the 24-7 Sports YouTube page to chat with Steve. But, Andrew, I got you here. I mean, even when Deuce Robinson makes his college football decision, That's not the end, right? It doesn't guarantee that he is playing college football. So how much longer could that baseball aspect of things linger for the program he ultimately chooses? Right, Emily, the uh, MLB combine is in late June, and then you got the draft on July 9th. So while he might be looking to make a decision here in the near future, this thing could stretch all the way into July, possibly even August. And all these schools that are recruiting Deuce Robinson are going to find a a spot for Deuce Robinson if they need him. What I thought was interesting about that graphic they just showed, Patrick Mahomes, he's going to play in the Super Bowl on Sunday. You know, he's a guy that appeared in one baseball game for Texas Tech before deciding, hey, I'm just going to do football. So uh, I still think regardless of 
what Deuce Robinson does, what decision he makes on the football side of the things. You're going to have that baseball aspirations. That's always going to be there. So I think this one will stretch well into July and possibly even August. And we might not even know what Deuce Robinson's going to do uh, until after his freshman year and when it comes to long term. All right, you mentioned the Super Bowl. We don't often talk NFL on this show, but with the big game this Sunday, we made an exception. Uh, but we have to do it in our own kind of recruiting way. So what you're looking at right now is a breakdown of the star ratings of players representing the Eagles and the Chiefs. As a reminder, though, upwards of like 200 plus players can be labeled as a four star during a cycle, while usually less than about 40 players are considered composite five stars. So the crop is, of course, a little bit different there, but still an interesting conversation. And let's continue it talking about some of those players with our national recruiting an analyst, Brian Doan. Brian, it's been a while. I remember last week talking about Nicholas Harbour, all the exciting things here. Uh, but you're here to kind of reminisce a little bit. And following yeah. some of these running backs, you actually covered Miles Sanders out of Penn State. And uh, a little pat on the back, though, for our evaluators here. He was the number one running back in the 2016 class. Having watched him in high school, what, what stood out then that helped him emerge as the top back in his class? Yeah, my first memory with Miles Sanders, he played out of Pittsburgh Woodland Hills, mm -hmm. was I go out to watch him in the WPIAL championships. They played at Heinz Field. He's having a good game. I think he finished, I looked it up, 87 yards, had a touchdown. He never saw the end of the game, though. No. He was hit on, on a tackle, I think it was on the last drive or the second to last drive of the game was stretchered off the field. It turned out his coach afterwards said it was a neck sprain. And, and I remember saying, man, I, I really wanted to see this kid. He, he looked special as a freshman. And then as I followed his career in high school, he just became so patient as a runner. And then he knew exactly when to explode, to kind of hit the hole and the athleticism to make people miss in space. And then he had the speed to take it the distance. Look, the WPIAL, it's a really tough league out in Western Pennsylvania. You're talking about a kid that ran for 4,573 yards and 59 touchdowns. Um, he, he was kind of the dude when he was a freshman, and by the time he was a senior, man, forget everybody in Pennsylvania knew him. Everybody in the country knew him. A good size. He was a physical runner, but he, he was just fluid and graceful, and you just knew how different he was when, when you turned and looked at him and, and watched him either on tape or in person or even in a camp setting. Brian, I know they always ask us these questions. Hey, what's the one moment you remember? You kind of touched on one, but if you look back and you tell your kids, hey, I saw Miles Sanders <laughs> play, what was that one specific moment maybe where you knew he was just different than other guys on the field or guys you'd ever seen in the past? Yeah, it was in that game, to be honest. And, and I remember having a similar thing with DeAndre Swift when he played as a freshman and you know went to Detroit. Lines and played at Georgia also. But with Miles Sanders, it was, you know, it looked, I, I remember it was a play run right, and it looked like they had him dead, couple yard loss, and he turned it into a first down, probably 12, 15 yard gain. And it wasn't anything that, you know, was outlandish to where you said, oh my goodness, nobody can touch this kid. But I mean, he was literally, he, he was nailed in the backfield. Um, he was able to escape use his vision, his patience, his acceleration. And I was like, man, a freshman does that? And, and I, you know, having kids, you, you see how special these athletes are with what they do on the field. And, and it was just, it was one of those moments where it's like, man, I can only imagine what this kid is going to be like in a few years. Uh, you called it though, right? You said this kid's going to be playing in a Super Bowl here in a few years, right? <laughs> you knew it then? <laughs> well, I figured he went to Penn State, and Penn mm -hmm. State always seems to have a few in the Super Bowl, so my chances were pretty good there. <laughs> That's true. All right, more recently, uh, you followed the recruitment of Chiefs rookie running back Isaiah Pacheco. He was a seventh-round pick out of Rutgers, and before that, he was just a three-star prospect from South Jersey. So what do you remember most about him and his recruitment? I just remember thinking, where is this kid going to play in college? He played quarterback, ran the ball a lot. And I think he, his senior year he threw for over 500, ran for over 1,000. He played some in the secondary. And I just remember, you know, his coach, you know, Dan, Dan Russo is a big Rutgers guy just in terms of he sent some kids there. And I remember when he committed to Rutgers and, and talking to the coach about it, he just said, listen, just put him on the field anywhere. They'll figure it out. Um, he, he was not a great pass catcher coming out of high school, but what you hear now with the Chiefs is what we heard with Rutgers, is what we heard with Vineland and going through the recruiting process. And he was a tough physical runner, 
Um, you know, everybody knows that, or most people I think know the tragic background of his brother was stabbed and, and murdered. His sister was shot and killed all while he was in high school. Um, as a matter of fact, just to tell you how mentally tough this kid is and, and kind of some of the things he's seen, you're talking about, you know, he went to the funeral in the morning and then at night he went and ran for 150 yards and three touchdowns in a game. He doesn't want to let anybody down. But I, I just remember thinking he was a really good player. Uh, and, and But where were they going to play him? You, you thought running back, but there was some talk of maybe slot because of his speed. And I think he ran like a 4.37 at the combine. So, so you knew the speed was there. And what he did at Rutgers during his time, at a time when Rutgers really struggled to block anyone, really, I think, is a reason why he, he dropped to the seventh round, to be honest. <laughs> well, that was going to be my follow-up question. Emily mentioned he was a seventh-round pick. It's been one of the big questions. I mean, you you have followed Rutgers as, as you, gave, you gave Penn State the love. Now you give Rutgers some love. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe how is he excelling as a seventh-round pick here uh, as a rookie? Yeah, I think, Andrew, I think one of the things you, I look at at least is let's not pretend the Chiefs thought he was going to be the end-all, be-all running back taking him in the seventh round. Um, and it just goes to show he went there and he worked hard. And, you know, Rutgers has had a lot of coaching changes and he committed under Chris Ash and then he finished his career under Greg Schiano. And for people that don't remember, I mean, Greg Schiano, when he was there the first time, he's used to sending guys to the NFL. I think on that team that he had that finished 11 and two, I think something like 19 of the 22 starters played in the NFL in their careers. But when, when Greg Schiano talks about that, Isaiah Pacheco is the guy who practices the hardest Forget game day practices the hardest. And listen, any coach that sees a kid practice hard who is really talented, it makes their job easier. And so when I hear stories like that on how he continued to be driven by what he wanted to accomplish for his family, it, to me, that's what really stands out about him. Um, like I said, when he was at Rutgers, they struggled a lot offensively. So the stats aren't there. And I think if the stats were there, he's probably a mid-round pick. You mentioned uh, his inspirational story. Brian, talking to you, this is really cool for us to be able to reminisce and, and think back on when you originally saw these guys play. How cool is it for you as somebody that follows these kids from a very early age to now see them play on an international stage like the Super Bowl? No, it, it's outstanding because it, it, I do exactly what you guys do. You reminisce, you think mm -hmm. about what it was, and in some kids you're like, wow, I can't believe that kid made it there. And then in other cases you're like, yeah, that, you know, we, we got that one right. But it's fun. I enjoy it. I don't spend a lot of time in contact with kids, you know, once I'm done covering and recruiting. I'll be honest about that. But when I see some of these kids, you know, at camps or they'll be at their schools at, at a school camp, mm -hmm. it, it's fun just to talk to them and see the journey they've been on and, and how their hard work has paid off. And I don't think people realize the sacrifice these kids make to be great. I mean, there is no going out on Fridays you know, great, you do everything on the field on Fridays or Saturdays whenever you play, but it, it's a 24-hour-a-day job just to be able to get on the field and, and perform at a high level. You don't just roll out of bed and do it. And so they sacrifice a lot, and it's why I, I, I love to see the success that they have. All right, that was, uh, that was the deep question. Now, quick, fun, who's, who's winning the game this weekend, Brian? Who you got? <laughs> Listen, I, I grew up as a Giants fan, so I have to okay. say that okay. Kansas City is going to win. Go but, you know, one of the thing, Emily, one of the things about this that's really cool, and, and you really kind of lose a lot of your fandom doing this, is yeah. like you just said, man, I would love to see Miles Sanders win this Super Bowl, just like I would like to see Pacheco win it. Mm -hmm. And so you start, you know, I, I think a lot in those terms. So whoever wins, just have a good game. I hope the commercials are good and <laughs> good time with family. I love it. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate the time. Hey, thank you, guys. For the next three or four years, I'll be committed to the University of... It's, 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 it's the moment that still brings chills to South Carolina fans. Nicholas Harbour is a Gamecock. That video is courtesy of the guy that you just heard from, and Brian Doan. But let's welcome in... Our next guest, Hale McGranahan, who covers South Carolina for the Big Spur. And Hale, the dust, it's uh, settled a little bit since South Carolina's big signing day victory. But how could Landing Harbor provide momentum for Shane Beamer's 2024 class? If anything, it just goes to show that, that 
Shane Beamer and his staff are, are capable of going and winning a, a recruiting battle for for a big time recruit like Nick Harbor. So when you look at some of the guys that South Carolina is in on for the 2024 class, it, at the very least, it, it should give South Carolina fans some confidence that that they can go and and, and do it again and, and get some of these big names that that they're in and on uh, at this stage of the game. Hey, when Shane Beamer took over uh, a few years ago, I think a lot of people kind of doubted him as a recruiter. His first transition class, whatever you want to call it, I think it finished 80th. It was one of the worst in all time in the SEC. You've seen him now uh, up close and in person. We know the Harbor thing, but there's a lot to like in that 2023 group as well. What has been the most impressive thing you have seen from Shane Beamer when it comes to recruiting? They've been willing to to leave no stone unturned, and and especially in the state of South Carolina, uh, that's been been an, an area of emphasis, obviously for for any coach, whether it's at South Carolina or at Clemson. They they want to take care of business in their own backyard, and and this staff, when when they got on on onto the trail in in 2021, and uh, they, they they were asking every high school coach in the state that they talked to. Who are your guys? Whether or not you think they're good enough to play at South Carolina or the SEC, let me hear about them. And, and they were diligent in trying to build some of those early relationships and and show that that that's where they wanted to get things started. And and they certainly have, especially with with the 2023 class and some of the guys that they've signed with that. And they'll continue to to do it again in 2024. They've already gotten one big piece to the puzzle added in Cam Pringle and and have a few more out there. Or in Mazio Bennett as well have a couple more out there that they're they're looking to add to, to that group that's that's off to a hot start right now. Yeah, Beamer's got that proof of concept, too, with the results on the field. Uh, speaking of 2024, already fifth right now in the rankings with just five commitments, though, so a lot to uh, a lot to be established there. But as you look ahead, what are a few positions that the staff will look to prioritize with this upcoming cycle? Yeah, offensive line is, is a very important one. And when, when you have to play teams like Clemson and Georgia every year where, where some of the best defensive linemen in the country are at, regardless of the recruiting class, it, you kind of want to have the best offensive lineman blocking those guys. So uh, it helps that, that, again, Cam Pringle is right down the road uh, in state down near Charleston, about an hour and a half from Columbia and, and, and an hour and a half the other direction. In another direction, there's, there's Josiah Thompson at Dillon High School, who, who's another highly rated offensive line recruit and, then in an hour and a half, another direction, there's there's Blake Franks, who's who's in Greenville. So it helps to be able to to build uh, a, a, an important position with guys who are who are just a stone's throw away. And, and again, that kind of goes back to the to to what I was saying earlier. They they want to start in state, and and having offensive linemen like those guys uh, really makes things a lot easier. Hale, uh, Emily mentioned it. South Carolina sent number five right now in the 2024 rankings. You brought up how they want to kind of secure the backyard, and we know a few of those targets. But what do you think the ceiling is for South Carolina in this 2024 cycle? Is there some other big fish out there like a Nicholas Harbor that they're just going to keep chipping away at down the stretch? Yeah, I, I think the ceiling, if you're looking at that top 10 range as, as the ceiling, in my opinion, that's that's pretty pretty – fair place to, to kind of set the expectations uh the guys i mentioned earlier of course are are priorities uh up in that that dmv area there's a defensive end named dylan stewart who's a, a big time prospect that that's been down to south carolina a lot uh there's another cornerback up there and Braden lee who's who's a highly rated four star who's been down a handful of times he's actually a, a former teammate of desmond yume azolu who who signed and is already enrolled at South Carolina. So you get a little, little boost there with that. And, and a couple receivers that, uh, that are relatively close by that they're looking at as well. So it's, it's got potential for, for this to be one of the, the best, if not the best South Carolina recruiting class on paper since, since 24 seven has been doing this stuff. Oh my goodness. We thought this year was great. We'll see what happens in the next cycle. Hale, thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. Have a good one. I appreciate it. The uh, Big Spur is the place to be for all your South Carolina news throughout the off season. Andrew, we're going to get to some viewer questions, but first, I got to tell you guys, we are five likes away from 50. 50 is just a nice round hole number that would, you know, make me really happy if I just saw that little like button, a little little mini 50 next to it. So uh, if you can, 
please smash that like button and we're gonna get to some of your viewer questions because we got some good ones today. I'm, I'm excited about these and we're gonna start with one that I know that, that you're excited to answer here. Uh, and that is from Hannah Glynn asking, how big of an impact will Tommy Reese's departure make on Notre Dame's recruiting? Well, I think it's a big blow for Notre Dame, and I think it's a big boost for Alabama. I mean, Tommy Reese, ever this since he's mean? been there in South Bend, he, he's been a recruiter. You know, there's all those videos of him last year getting out on the road, flying around with Marcus Freeman. I think he's a big reason why C.J. Carr committed to the Irish. He's a big reason why Kenny Minchie, their quarterback signing in 2023, is there. And, uh, you know, he's he he's involved in all aspects of the offensive recruiting. And that's kind of rare for offensive coordinators these days. But I think why Reese is able to do that is because He's on the younger side, right? He's not one of these older play callers. He's still young. He can relate to these kids. So I do think it's a blow for Notre Dame. And I'm interested to see what happens at Alabama. Look at Alabama. It was Lane Kiffin. I mean, Lane Kiffin loves to to play everything up on social media. I, I don't know how much of an actual recruiter he is at the end of the day when it comes to getting out on the road, building relationships with underclassmen. And then Bill O'Brien. I mean, the kids never would bring up Bill O'Brien. So I do think it is a blow for Notre Dame. We'll see what happens for them. I mean, I'm sure they'll find someone else that can get the job done. But in terms of, a, a, of an OC that knew how important talent acquisition was, Tommy Reese is, is one of the best out there. Man, thank goodness. I mean, Alabama needs help on the recruiting <laughs> trail. I mean, they are just struggling. So good thing they've, they've got a strong recruiter in there. Uh, we'll see what he does at Alabama. We got another question here from Nick. Uh, why do you think Georgia is willing to take all of these quarterbacks, even though it seems like they're leading for Dylan Rayola? That's a good question, Nick. Well, Steve brought it up. I mean, Georgia did not take an arm here in the 2023 cycle. They do have a quarterback committed uh, in 2024, but just with the current quarterback market in, in terms of the transfer portal, how much movement we see, uh, I think a lot we're going to see more and more schools taking two quarterbacks when they can. If you can do that, uh, you, you got to do it. But just be just with how uh, you know the the free movement, um, and then think about it like this: How many times did you watch a, a football game late in the season, and, and there's the number two or number three quarterback in there? I mean, you got to get that right. I think Georgia likes what they have on campus. One of the big reasons why they didn't take a transfer is because they didn't want a Carson Beck or a Brock Vandergrift to leave and enter the transfer portal. So uh, I, I think the other thing with this whole uh, them offering a Jake Merklinger is, look, Georgia, two-time defending national champs, man, they they have the luxury to squeeze some kids. Hey, yeah, you, Dylan, you are our number one priority right now. We want you, uh, but we're not going to sit around and wait forever. Uh, so they can twist the arm a little bit and, and extend some other scholarship offers, go that direction. So I, I think it's a, a combination of all those different things. And, and when you're Georgia, you have the luxury uh, of, of telling kids, hey, we're eventually going to move on. You're saying other schools might have to kind of strategically toe that line, but when you've got the hardware like Georgia does, you can, uh, Absolutely. you can leave them hanging for a little bit. All right, we got this next question here from Mega Hamilton 32 You guys, while I'm looking at these questions, I see we did hit 50. We're at 55 now, so yeah, I'm just going to set another goal. Let's, let's hit 60, 70, 100 maybe would be great. Uh, this next question here is, who are some of the top schools for Ernest Willer right now, the five-star defensive lineman out of IMG? That's been a difficult one to, to kind of get your pulse on. Ernest Willer, the first time we met him was at the Under Armour Future 50 event. He had just transferred into IMG Academy. He's a kid from up there in, in, in the DMV. Uh, I asked him, hey, you know, have you been on any visits? Have you been to any schools? And he was kind of like, no, I, you know, I'm just, this whole recruiting process is is new to me. Uh, he was at Miami this season for a few games. He also has been to Penn State in the past. I, I said it a while back when we first started kind of putting together our 2024 rankings and dissecting that uh, 2024 class in the state of Florida, I said, everyone is going to be at IMG Academy for Ernest Willer uh, and David Stone. Those are going to kind of be the two guys. We haven't really seen a ton of other interior defensive linemen emerge in the South. So I think his recruitment has got a ways to go. I'll always say this with the, the transplants at IMG Academy, usually the rule of thumb 
is they return back home to some to, to that home region, you know, somewhere close to where they came from. That's usually kind of the case. I mean, obviously, there are some outliers, kids that will end up in a different parts of the country. Francis Mauago, for example, American Samoa. Now he's at Miami after staying at IMG. But usually they try to return back home. So I'd keep an eye on Penn State. But uh, again, I think his recruitment will be one that probably stretches well into the summer with some official visits. And I wouldn't be surprised if he even went into the season. He seems like a kid that is pretty reserved when it comes to uh, releasing information. It's probably why people are asking about it. They're hoping <laughs> that uh, you have that information. Okay, we are. Well, we are ask, me, ask me after IMG's pro day, okay. and, and I think it's a month from now, once we get to sit oh, down sure with him on a better answer. Okay, perfect. Hopefully you can, uh, you can bring the intel back to this show. We are one like away from 60, so let's just go ahead and get 60, and again, 70, 80, you know, hit that like button. Uh, we love to hear from you there. Another question here. Asking, what are your thoughts on Jeremiah Smith? And do you think he is still locked in with OSU, even though Dylan Rayola decommitted? I think Jeremiah Smith is locked in all the way. I think he has, uh, and I said it, I mean, back in, back in the summer months, I thought Ohio State was the landing spot for him. I think that's where he wants to go. You talk with people inside his camp, which would include uh, you know, I mean, his his cousin is Geno Smith, so the family has been through the recruiting process before. They're very calculated. They knew when they made this decision. Uh, I think Jeremiah Smith is the perfect fit for what Brian Hartline and, and Ryan want day want to do there. I don't think Dylan Rayola really changes anything for Jeremiah Smith. I think he is more signed up to play for in Zone Six for Brian Hartline. So to me, I think the only way that Jeremiah Smith would waver on his decision would be Brian Hartline potentially leaving to go somewhere else at, at the end of the upcoming season. You know, he was linked to the Cincinnati job. He's now the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. If they win some games like they always do, he's going to be a very hot name. So I think he's locked in. Uh, I don't think he's wavering. I think it's about as firm of a commitment as you could get at this stage in the process. I mean, these quarterback dominoes are always so fun to see where they fall. And we have a lot of time before these prospects put pen to paper. Um, speaking of quarterbacks, we got a question here. What are your favorite underrated quarterbacks for either dual threat or pocket passer? So anything uh, that nobody is talking about enough in 2024. Got, I think Aaron, Aaron Nolan, and this Ooh. this came out of nowhere, so I'm, I'm kind of I like, shooting. I know, that's, I was excited <laughs> to hear what you said. Okay. Aaron Nolan's a kid at, at Langston Hughes. We moved him up into our top 247 last time we did our, our position audits. Uh, there's already been some conversations behind the scenes about maybe even moving him up even more after the senior season he had at Langston Hughes, threw for over 50 touchdowns. Uh, you know, he's an explosive, twitchy guy, but he's not really a run first type of quarterback. Um, you know, he's accurate. The, the one knock on him from a scout's eye, and, and this isn't really a knock, is he's just a southpaw. He's a left-hander. And when you take a left-handed quarterback, you know, it kind of changes how you practice a little bit, right? If everyone's right-handed and then this guy comes in to run a few reps, he's left-handed. So you kind of have to think long-term with your quarterback room. I thought he'd be a perfect fit at Auburn for that previous staff under Brian Harson. there. Um, interested to see what happens with him. Alabama just recently offered him a scholarship. Um, the guys at, uh, inside the U with the Miami site just reported that he's supposed to be on campus, I think, the first work weekend in March. But as more and more of these dominoes fall, I think more schools are going to turn and pivot to Air Noland. Uh, and I don't think that's his, actually his, his real name, but that's what it is on his profile, Aaron Nolan. And it's by far one of the better ones in the, in the 2024 cycle. You're not sure if that's his real name? I, get <laughs> I think it's, I, 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 it's, it's a nickname that, is, that <laughs> has taken you. over. So Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, legal Aaron, name, legal, awesome. legal name. Legal name. Legal name. I, don't know I if, gotcha. I, mean, <laughs> I gotcha. It's fun. Yeah, you mentioned Alabama. They've uh, had some success with a pretty good lefty quarterback into a Tungo Vailoa not too long ago. So, you know, maybe they'll work with him. Our final question here from Adam S. With four defensive linemen in the top 12 in 2024, our rankings expert here. How close are those guys when it comes to ranking them, Andrew? I think they're close. I mean, when we. 
initially put together that top 32 uh, following the, the, the mid-season audit for the 2024 class. I mean, we were really kind of searching for more defensive linemen. We felt like we wish we could get some more pass rushers up in that group. Uh, we, we talked about David Stone. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I think him and Ernest Willer, I mean, they're on the same team. Not much of a difference. Definitely Stone, we, we think more highly of him, which is why they're in the rankings. But for us, as we kind of dig in here uh, in advance of our next 2024 update, one of the big things we are going to be searching for is just those pass rushers. I mean, you look at the NFL draft right now, and we're always kind of, you know, that's the compass for our rankings. But it's, it's just interesting to hear different analysts and how front offices are thinking. And, you know, even in years where an edge group or an interior defensive line group might not be deep, a lot of teams will try to take guys with trades. So we're hoping to identify some new names. I think there's going to be a ton of movement for us. Not only in that uh, that top two four seven, but but really in that top thirty two and and then that top fifty, we're looking for the defensive lineman. We love the camp season, right? Last year, the Under Armour Atlanta camp, which is coming up in a few weeks. I mean, that was loaded with creatures in, in terms of big bodies. As you got kids from the Carolinas, you got kids from Alabama, and, and then kids obviously from the Peach State. So we'll see. We're still sorting it out. Uh, I, I think we're all kind of still getting a little crash course in the, in that twenty twenty four and the next few weeks. We're we're diving in and trying to watch as much film as we can and gather information. Do you realize you just had like a call to action there? You're telling, but you're looking for defensive linemen. So your Twitter DMs are just going to be flooded <laughs> with tape. Well, they make, yeah, I know. Oh my gosh. I cannot even imagine. Um, yeah. Every time you're on here, we try to squeeze out as much information as we possibly can. And we could talk to you all afternoon. Um, but guys, you're in luck. You can catch more Andrew Ivins and his friend Cooper Patagna on the 24-7 Sports Recruiting Podcast. They have new episodes every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. Andrew, appreciate you gracing us with your presence and all your great information. Uh, we enjoy having you on the show. For Andrew Ivins, I'm Emily Proud, and this is the College Football Recruiting Show.